Thank, thank you very much, uh, Vasu and, and Eddie. Um, uh, uh, honorable members, um, I really have time constraints. I've just consulted with the Secretary of Parliament to see if we can go to quarter to five. Speaker, can we do that? To five o'clock? Oh, great, thank you very much. So then, um, what I will do is the same thing, open the house to members on the other side, and I have the gentleman in the middle there, And then the lady at the front, yeah. You're first the gentleman, then yourself. Thank you, sir. Thank you, program director. My name is Richard Klope, uh, Sanko Provincial Secretary. Uh, firstly, I would like to welcome the input made by the Gentlemen on the uh, podium, I just want to talk about two things. One is a, is a challenge uh, confirming that yes, the challenge is class in nature. It results into exploitation of workers. It has a factor of unionization resistance by employers. As a, res as a result, there is a process of replacement of labor, workers that are in unions. I don't agree 100%, I would agree with 25% of the issue of tech shops, because we discovered that those people that have tech shops have got no license, you know. So there is uh, nothing being competed when a, a person does not have a license and uh, he or she is fronting. They are fronting for others because they, those others buy bulk and give to those African people. It's a challenge. The last one, which is a, a proposal, because one appreciates the input made by uh, Honorable Comrade Naledi on the issue of adequacy. That as, uh, as South Africans, we did not adequately address this issue of migration. That there's a need for proper legislation. You know, uh, as much as we we, we agree that we, as liberation movements, been to other countries, but it was properly legislated. legislated. There were camps. You know, there are categories of uh, migrants. Those who seek for jobs, those who seek for asylum, some are very much fit. They were soldiers. They ran away from other countries. Uh, they're just here, uh, not properly registered in South Africa. We're saying they should be a proper legislation. People who belong to camp know all those things. Uh, so in a, much, a nutshell, we're saying we need to know who is who in the zoo, who is where, to avoid criminality, all those things. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, uh, uh, moderator. My name is uh, Gertrude Menda from Zambia. Um, for those who know, Zambia was a frontline state under uh, Kenneth Kaunda. And uh, we know that during the liberation struggle of South Africa, a lot of our people died because uh, the apartheid regime uh, found it fit any time to go and bomb that country. We've lost some very prominent people, including our famous broadcaster, Mr. Ali Kinkata, and a lot of others Zambians who died in the process. Um, uh, it's a pity Professor is gone, but I really want to appreciate, um, in fact, I want to appreciate everybody, uh, all the, um, um, the resource persons who spoke, 
but I just wanted to agree with the issue that Professor brought about, about history. We all have migrated from somewhere. And maybe, let me just say, some of us, um, we, uh, we, we migrated from here. If you want, you can go and Google Sibitwani, go and Google Skele Etu. These are the people who came from Free State and went into my country, and in fact, they became rulers for some time. So if I come here, I'm just stressing my roots. <laughs> there should be no xenophobic, xenophobic attack on me. I'm just coming back home <laughs> to trace my roots. Um, um, I just, my intervention is just to ask that let there be some survey or some research uh, conducted to find out Apart from migrants coming from the rest of Africa to South Africa, can somebody do a research and find out how many South Africans are in Africa? Yes, because we just look at one-way traffic. I believe that there are also South Africans all over Africa. They, they've gone there. So I think that is very important. And also to advise the leaders that... Um, the way I'm seeing these xenophobic attacks, it's by young people who don't know the history. And I think it's, it's important, when you've done that, that, uh, that study, go out there and tell these young people the, what happened before the history. Um, uh, the president of Mozambique, the late president, Samora Machel, died here when he was coming from he was coming from the frontline states fighting the apartheid regime on behalf of South Africans. That history, let it be told to the people of South Africa, to the young people of South Africa. Um, so uh, after that study and so on, let me just advise that you the leaders, when you tell these young people, start a process of informing the young people about uh, all these issues, where they came from, and uh, maybe the cause of this migration. And I just want to advise that I can offer our president, Kenneth Kaunda, who is still alive. He was very good at educating masses on a particular issue. He was very good at educating the Zambians about one Zambia, one nation. Maybe he can be very, he's still very sharp, actually, mentally. He can help you in the One Africa, One Nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, I have been given permission to go up until five o'clock because I think we have to really express our appreciation to the speaker for having had this conversation. I think it's a very important conversation to have. And obviously it's not going to end here. But uh, given the extension of our time, I'd like to ask one person from this side, one person from the other side, just to equalize things. Um, because inequality has been raised so much. So I will ask the gentleman over there who's standing up as the third person on this side, and then one person from the side of the house. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairperson. My name is Mveli Mavundra from Sanko, KZN. Um, Chairperson, whilst the debate is academic and, and, and addressing issues <clears throat> based on the experiences on the xenophobic attack, <clears throat> I think largely, and my comrade from COSAT was raising this, we haven't really um, gone down to the basic issues. Yes, history will be important to address. Uh, the mobilization and the, the regulation of laws on movements of people. But xenophobia happened at a grassroots. It did not happen at the level of the, of the people in this room, elite and middle class. It happened at the lower level communities where poverty is strong and where the scarcity of resources 
makes people to see, uh, consider other advantages from one another. And this issue is going to be a, an, an elephant in the room, and my sister here from Malawi uh, pricked it up. But it is not just a South African issue. It is going to be a South African, a Malawian, a Mozambican, for as long as, as, as I think the professor said before, we are addressing urbanization in established former colonial and former apartheid establishments. And in the rural areas and townships where the poverty, inequality, and unemployment has got a huge impact, we are not addressing it at that level. And therefore, the legislators focus, and the SANCO, we, where we are at the community level, the legislators focus is to review the level of investment where people are. And, and, and I'm, I'm happy Mr. Gowden, in his finding, in his document, addresses the issue of um, industrial development. Because for as long as people are poor and they see a, a, a Zulu, in a Zulu strong established area, they see only Kosas getting jobs. I'm not even talking inter Africa, I'm talking just within Africa. They, th that pricks um, a, 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 a big war. Or Kosas, they see uh, Malawians taking their jobs. So it's going to be continuing for as long as legislators allow capital to be invested in white areas. Let me say as I end, the middle class in South Africa is changing. And, and most black people are coming strongly into the fore. But their pension funds and their medical aids are still being taken and invested by pension fund companies in, in these urbanized established areas in pre-colonial era. It is not being invested in townships and in rural areas where people are. So if we don't review and we do our legislation such that we start improving people at where they are, the issue of xenophobia or Afrophobia or whatever you call it will continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So one person on this side. There's somebody unfortunate. Uh, uh, my name is Judith Zimande from the Zulan Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, I just want to address this issue as well of xenophobic attacks, which I think as South Africans we need to do more. There is more for us to do without even looking outside. We need to look at the places which are really rural places where people don't understand what is going on. We talk about xenophobics. There is high rate of unemployment. That high rate and poverty, this is causing xenophobic attacks. Because these people in the rural areas, what they only see is these people are taking our jobs. And Tina si Alamba si so what they are thinking of is actually the only way to do so for us it's more of focusing on the rural areas where unemployment is very high and it's HIV and AIDS is very high. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think that, uh, firstly, let me appreciate uh, the inputs that have been made. But uh, more importantly, go to the input that was made by the Premier right at the beginning. An input that says, we dealt with the issue of uh, the violence. But we are at a level where we are beginning to look at what are the root causes to the violence? Because any problem has got four aspects in it. The first one that will show the head is the symptom or the indicator that there is a problem somewhere. And if that remains unattended to, it then gives, become, it, it gives a, a results. And if the symptom is attended to, it then subsides. But you then 
do not need to stop there if you want to address the, the reoccurrence of the problem. You will then look at one, this was the violence, the violence is a symptom. What was the cause to the violence? And in all the reports that are coming, the, the violence was caused by socioeconomic conditions that we find ourselves in, in South Africa, but also in countries of origin of the people that were affected by the violence. And we need to begin to look at that. The socioeconomic conditions in countries of origin and socioeconomic conditions in South Africa. I think that is very, very important for us to look at. But what becomes interesting is that a, in our discussions here, we are allowing ourselves to be put against each other by the monopoly capital. If what, if what is reported as what happened at Guajina store is what sparked the violence, where the employer could not resolve the issue with the indigenous people of South Africa who were employees to address those issues and chose to replace them with foreign nationals who are easy for him to exploit and pay them slave wages, then the elephant in the room is the monopoly capital. We should not be fighting against each other as Africans. We should be fighting the structure of the economy in the African continent because it is true that a eh, there is a society that is not participating in the mainstream of the economy and that society are the indigenous people of Africa. And there is a society that is trading in Africa and those are the people that are involved in trading and are involved in bringing goods in our countries. Let us address the root causes and the root causes is how the economy is structured in the African continent. Thank you very much. I will, um, thank you very much, members. Um, I think that I'm going to start winding down now to the end, uh, because I think that we, 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 this is an unfinished business. And I will ask for one comment from the two gentlemen, and then I will do a summary, just in response to what has been said. In response to Honorable Ruth Bengu, uh, let me say that uh, I think when the professor said we need to do away with geography, and Professor Olokushi said we need to revive history, the other thing that we need to revive, which is dead, is ideology. This is key. Unless we have an ideology that underpins all of our policy frameworks, etc., we will not get anywhere. We can't deal with monopoly capital unless we have an ideology that we deal with monopoly capital. So I think that will be a starting point. But let me just make one point. I think uh, the gentleman, Richard from Sanko, I think you correctly pointed out, it's not just about tuck shops. It's about the struggle for resources. And that resource is employment. It's about livelihoods. Uh, and it can be about any employment or livelihood. Tuck shops were just one form of employment that we're fighting about. Uh, and what the uh, professor said is that we are in the longest period of economic growth, which is true in Africa. So correctly titled Africa Rising, this is true this uh, particular panel, Africa Rising, because we are. But anywhere in the world, whether that was in Europe, North America, Asia, when there was this long period of economic growth and a shift from one economy to another economy, there's huge disruption. What we are dealing with now 
is that huge disruption. Now, how long it will take us to get out of this huge disruption could be a generation, two generations, that's 20 or 40 years. That's how long this disruption can take place. It will depend on what we do as legislators, as governments, as people on the continent. Because that development that we see, if it doesn't keep pace with the other issues of urbanization, exponential uh, population growth, etc., and if that keeps widening, then it will take us longer and longer. At the beginning of all of that, underpinned by ideology. So we need to think about those things. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I was also our sister from the Honorable Member from Zambia. I think she makes a very strong point because by roads, they come from South Africa, they are to speakers in Zambia and so on. And when you spoke about President Kanet Kaunda, you also reminded me that uh, he himself was a victim of xenophobic onslaught by a successor president who declared him a non-national and said, so xenophobia is quite a, a, an African problem in many ways. <laughs> but I want, to, I, want, I want to just to illustrate the, the, the extent of the challenge we have to tell you about what my mother said. Uh, uh, three years ago, I lost my father and I, I worked with the foreign minister of South Africa and she came for condolences, she couldn't attend the funeral, and she came. My mother was still dressed in black. So it was for the first time my mother encountered her, and my mother asked her, by the way, where do you come from? She says, oh, mama, I'm from Limpopo. He says, oh, you are the people who are taking our children's jobs. Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you, Professor and, uh, and Mr. Vasugaudan.